want to discuss Russian cosmism with you, but first, a little aside. So here's my Twitter. You see, I wrote earlier today that I'd never heard of Andrew Tate before yesterday. And today I see a hundred videos and posts about him. And I ask what's going on. And the same day you see here's Mike Cernovich. Some of you may know him asking, do you know who Andrew Tate is? So what's, uh, what's going on here with Andrew Tate? I wonder whether anybody watching this follows him and knows the kind of manosphere or whatever it is that he's a part of in whatever context it is he's coming up in. And part of the reason why I'm interested in the question is because, you know, I work on a controversial thinker, Alexander Dugan, which is why when I saw this video pop up on my YouTube, Andrew Tate is the new Alex Jones. He has so many views in such a short time. And, you know, Anthony uh, Pompliano, Pomp here. I like his videos on Bitcoin and finance and all of that. I was watching some of them. And then I saw this video, Andrew Tate's the new Alex Jones. I thought, okay, Alex Jones is a controversial figure. You know, he had the lawsuits against him recently. And Robert Barnes was on Michael Malice's show talking about that, sort of running you through the lawfare against Alex Jones. And uh, Jones, you may know, he's got this book out, uh, or coming out, August 30th, The Great Reset and the War for the World, and it's doing really well. It's number seven on the charts. So controversial figures, you know, Alex Jones, Alexander Dugan, they interest me. And by the way, this uh, theme of The Great Reset, Dugan has a book, The Great Awakening versus The Great Reset, and here's a book that just uh, is on its way out in October against The Great Reset. 18 Theses Contra the New World Order. And the people who contributed here, they're not uh, crackpots. You know, they're serious, uh, serious scholars. Some names you may recognize, Michael Anton, Conrad Black, okay, Victor Davis Hansen, Roger Kimball, James uh, Poulos. So, all right, there are people who write about the Great Reset. Uh, they, they happen to include Alexander Dugan. They happen to include Alex Jones. So I saw this video come up on my YouTube and I started to watch it. And you know, he, uh, maybe you know who Andrew Tate is, maybe you don't, hence Cernovich's poll here. But this was my first impression of him, okay? He's got the look that he comes into the studio with. But what really was most interesting and kept me watching at the start of the video, he says that his dad was a chess grandmaster with a super high intelligence and that in the house he was in awe of his father's intelligence, that he remembered phone numbers after he heard them once for the rest of his life, that he remembered addresses after he heard them once for the rest of his life. And as somebody who works on philosophy and intellectuals, I could relate to the awe that you have before people with high intelligence. So, you know, it's not like the first thing he said in this interview was, uh, his attitude towards women or something else like that. No, he started off with the praise of intelligence, with the praise of the mind of a chess grandmaster. So that kept me watching. And frankly, the interview, I didn't finish it. I haven't finished it yet. I got quite a long way through, but it's worth watching. It's pretty interesting. And that was my first exposure to this guy, Andrew Tate. And then suddenly he's all over my feeds everywhere. Now, of course, some of that is the algorithm, but obviously you know, other people are talking about him. Here's Cernovich from today. So what's going on with this guy? If anybody has some opinions about Andrew Tate, what he's getting right, what he's getting wrong, is he just in this domain of quote unquote controversial thinkers who say things to get attention, but use that as an opportunity to slide in some uncomfortable truths? Or is there something completely different going on? You know, because I also subscribe to this guy's videos right here, CoffeeZilla. Uh, you don't see his channel name, right? So there you go, CoffeeZilla. And he does like scam exposés. You know, and his video came up on my feed today. I joined Andrew Tate's cult and it was worse than I thought. So he's here saying that uh, apparently Andrew Tate has this thing called Hustlers University. And this guy, CoffeeZilla, is uh, doing an unmasking. You know, it's a, big, it's a big scam. It's not worth getting involved in, according to him in his video. So once again, this one I watched it and I was like, man, that's actually pretty interesting. This character, his background, you know, how he's laying things out is sort of, especially there's a conversation about racism in America versus racism in Romania. That is kind of worth listening to, I think. It uh, gets you thinking about some things. So 
who is Andrew Tate? What do you think about him? What do you know about him? What does he get right? What does he get wrong? And what do you make of quote unquote controversial thinkers who mix sometimes truth bombs or whatever you want to put it with uh, all of the outrages that are necessary in the attention economy? Uh, so I'm just curious about that. Okay. And once again, I had this on screen just to show you, you know, because here the title was Andrew Tate is the new Alex Jones. And then I also watched this video, Michael Malice with Robert Barnes, walking you through the legal attacks on Alex Jones. So I just, you know, that was a nice connection. And you should watch these guys, these commentators, they're bringing something to light about the nature of the attacks that take place against controversial thinkers. On the other hand, you have some quote unquote controversial thinkers or controversial figures who may go too far. So where do you draw the line? What's the line for you? And uh, what do you make of all of that? Well, that's what I wanted to say about Andrew Tate. I'm completely new to him, as I said here. I never heard of Andrew Tate before yesterday and today. I see hundreds of videos and posts about him, what's going on with that. And then, you know, people people make their comments. Uh, by the way, this is my Twitter if you want to follow me, M underscore Millerman. And then I saw other people posting about him. So that's Andrew Tate. Uh, let me know what you think about that. The other thing, the really main thing I wanted to go over with you is this, uh, this book that I read recently on the Russian cosmists, the esoteric futurism of Nikolai Fyodorov, Fedorov and his followers. So I wrote, uh, I wrote this letter to my uh, newsletter, the subscribers of my newsletter, and I thought I'd just uh, go over it with you because it's pretty fascinating. So I have the book here. Let me give you the full screen version. Look at that beauty, beautiful cover. The Russian cosmists, the esoteric futurism of Nikolai Fedorov and his followers, or Fyodorov and his followers. Beautiful book. I really recommend it, but I also want to just give you an overview of it. And I forgot we have an active chat going on. So before I jump over to that, whoops, sorry. Let me, uh, let me get this up on screen. As you see, I always have this problem. Okay, maybe it tells me I should stop using this program, but I've gotten used to it. So there you go. Okay, what's going on in the chat? Hello, everybody. Nice to be with you. It's been a while since I did these live streams. I cranked up the volume on my equipment, so hopefully you can hear me better than in the last video or series of videos. Have I read Dugan's anti kamenos No, I haven't. Okay, so I've read the table of contents and I see that it has a lot there on um, Satanism and things like that. Not championing it, obviously, but uh, it, you know, Dugan, okay, people should understand. Dugan is a prolific author. He's got many books. Some of them I've translated, some of them I've studied, but not all of them. And he often publishes materials in compilation form as well. So I haven't read everything he's published. I haven't read anti -Kamenos. If you have, feel free to comment about that. Um, I think it's great that he continues to put out materials. It makes it difficult to keep track of everything, but they're good and they're worth reading and studying. I hope that more people do it. Uh, Elon says, Tate is the new Alex Jones. Well, that's what the title of the video was. What can I tell you? Um, Nice to see everybody's hacked the algorithms in his running a pyramid scheme. A very clever exploit of attentionalism. Well, definitely it seems today like all of the attention is on him. I'm telling you his interview with Pomp, I watched most of and I stopped not because it was boring, but because I had to go to sleep. So I, I found it to be pretty entertaining and, and interesting. People are asking, is he being promoted? Uh, is he being pushed or pumped? Marco writes, I found him a degenerate scumbag ruining people and poisoning nations wherever he goes. So Marco, maybe you want to elaborate on that so people know uh, what exactly you're referring to about the poisoning of nations and all of that. He seems to have embraced to a certain extent, uh, like he says in that video that he's been called a pimp, so he starts calling himself a pimp, but explaining that in his view, uh, the webcam girls that he made his millions on were benefited by his... Um, entrepreneurship and things like that. So, hey, I'm just telling you, it came up. I thought the interview was interesting and I thought I'd ask you because I assume you've heard more about him than I have. Uh, my opinion on Nick Land. Honestly, I haven't read Nick Land. I'll tell you the truth. I do follow Justin Murphy and he's been publishing in his newsletter about Nick Land. So you might want to have a look at Justin Murphy's newsletter and keep track of that conversation. But uh, I can't comment because I haven't read him. Okay, well, feel free to keep the conversation going about... Uh, Andrew Tate, we're obviously feeding the attention that he's getting, but I want to tie that in, like I said, to the question of controversial thinkers, quote unquote, and uh, 
the fact that he spoke so highly about chess players and intelligence really appealed to me at the start of his interview with Pomp, I'm not going to lie. And uh, that was a nice way for him to, uh, you know, hook, uh, hook my attention at any rate. So maybe he's cracked the attention algorithm. I don't know. Well, let's take a let's take a little break from Andrew Tate for a minute and go to this Russian Cosmist book. I want to share it with you because more and more I want to write and, and do videos about things I've been reading so that I can uh, convey some of that to those of you who may be interested, whether you have the time or not to read the book. So, as I said, this is by George M. Young, a book about the Russian Cosmists. Let's see how the book characterizes this movement of thought. So, quoting now, main themes in Cosmist thought include the active human role in human and cosmic evolution, the creation of new life forms, including a new level of humanity, the unlimited extension of human longevity to a state of practical immortality. You know, should that be one of our technological goals? The physical resurrection of the dead. So a pretty fascinating feature of Fedorov's or Fyodorov's uh, futurism is that he thought we need to physically resurrect all of the dead. And one of the ways that you do that is you have to recover their bodily particles, which are now out in the cosmos. And so there's like a kind of technical futurism associated with making the Earth a spaceship that can go gather the particles of the previously departed for the sake of their physical resurrection. Crazy, but fascinating also. Serious scientific research into matters long considered subjects fit only for science fiction, occult, and esoteric literature. That's another point about these thinkers, the Russian cosmists. They had a genuine interest in science fiction, occult, and esoteric type subjects, but they combined it with a genuine, added, like a genuinely scientific attitude. Another feature of Russian cosmism, the exploration and colonization of the entire cosmos, the emergence on our biosphere of a new sphere of human thought called the noosphere, and other far-reaching projects, some of which may no longer seem, the author says, as impossible or crazy as they did when first proposed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Okay, next, the book gives eight factors that contribute to the high degree of interest in cosmism among today's Russian intellectuals. So one of the points in the book is that this school of thought, cosmism, has a new group of supporters in contemporary Russia, and it's like, what was appealing to them? What are they doing with it? How are they developing it? Well, the eight factors that contribute to the high degree of interest in cosmism among today's Russian intellectuals, which help us to understand the specificity of Russian thought, may also provide useful context, among other things, for reading and interpreting Dugin. Okay, so I don't know how often you've thought about Alexander Dugin and Russian cosmism together, but, uh, but these factors of Russia's interest in cosmism, I think, are helpful to look at. So here's what they are, some quoting and some paraphrasing. Expansiveness and comprehensiveness. First, the cosmists, like many Russians, are expansive thinkers. Their worldview attempts to comprehend all humanity, all time, all space, all science, art, and religion. So you have the characteristic comprehensiveness of their project, or at least of their intentions. Second, the cosmists emphasize their Russianness, the adjective they frequently use in referring to both early and recent cosmist thought is отечественный, native, patriotic, without the Latinate flavor it carries in English, okay, like отечество's fatherland, uh, like fatherlandish, but without the Teutonic connotations. The word, when applied to cosmist thought, can suggest that even the most unorthodox speculations are grounded in the rich damp Russian soil. So it's, it's interesting because it's this technologistic, futuristic, comprehensive account of things that still remains rooted in its Russianness. The cosmist thinkers would probably be placed outside or on the periphery of the modern Western philosophical tradition with its rationalist or empiricist principles, its narrowing into specialized interests, and its emphasis on epistemology. Whereas in the God-seeking, but human-centered philosophical tradition, emphasizing the existential, the historiosophic, and the eschatological, the cosmists are well within the mainstream. So that's also pretty interesting. You have this comprehensiveness, the scientificity or the technological aspect, but also this 
uh, God-seeking but human-centered existential historiosophic eschatological, eschatological outlook. Okay, the cosmists are characterized as well by a certain kind of anti-Westernism. To the cosmists, the intellectual culture of the West is isolative, individualistic, arrogant, divisive, uncentered, and self-destructive. Cosmism is presented as a robust, native alternative to the fashionable but shallow and overrated Western intellectual currents of deconstruction, ecosophism, species egalitarianism, and other alien abominations. To its adherents, cosmism is a continental Eurasian antidote to the growing threat of cultural and intellectual Atlanticism. So that's pretty interesting. As we look at our intellectual situation and see where we're experiencing a crisis and where we need to consider some alternatives, it can be helpful to look at something that is completely different. Okay, Russian cosmism represents something that is completely different. A continental Eurasian antidote to the growing threat of cultural intellectual Atlanticism, as this author puts it. Fourth, the cosmists were banned during the Soviet period. Their works could not be published, and the thinkers themselves were either forced into emigration or sent to the gulag. After the fall of communism, the writings that had been most strenuously prohibited understandably became the most appealing. So in other words, why are the cosmists so interesting for contemporary Russians? Because they were suppressed in the Soviet period, and now it's possible to rediscover the rich, hidden past and have it become, as he puts it, a major part of the Russian version of the distant future. Okay, these are the points of appeal that have Russian cosmism, an older tradition, be appealing to contemporary Russian thinkers in a way that I believe could be interesting for us in the West as well. Okay, so we saw their expansiveness, the fact that it's rooted in a Russian interpretation of Russian identity, that it's anti-Western, that it was banned under communism and therefore has some sort of appeal as a recovered hidden past and sort of secret teaching. Fifth, many of the cosmists were polymaths, not only interested in, but highly competent in two, three, or half a dozen specialized disciplines. As philosophers, artists, natural scientists, theologians, and social activists, individually and collectively, they tended to be encyclopedic in their erudition. That's again, sort of the comprehensiveness, right? Encyclopedic, comprehensive. Jacks of all intellectual trades and masters of most. So to link this, just kind of arbitrarily, but still, to link this to the Andrew Tate thing, the worship of or awe in the face of the capacities of the intellect. Mysticism. Sixth, the author writes, much, uh, like much Russian religious and spiritual writing, cosmism has a profoundly mystical, occult, esoteric dimension. And now listen to this amazing fact. A study of Russian publications in the 1990s found that some 39% of all nonfiction books published in Russia in that decade had something to do with the occult. Pretty amazing. Uh, if any of you, by the way, watching this are uh, Russian speakers or from Russia or from Eastern Europe, maybe you can attest to the presence of the occult in nonfiction books of the 1990s and of the 2000s. A trip through any large bookstore in Russia today would probably produce a similar, if not even larger, unofficial tally. The air of intellectual legitimacy that cosmism lends to certain occult or semi-occult speculations accounts for some of the appeal of the movement today. Pretty fascinating. I thought that was amazing. 39% of all nonfiction books published in Russia in that decade had something to do with the occult. Seventh feature and characteristic, guys, I'm going to go through this, then I'll pop over to the chat. Thanks for being here. By the way, it's always a pleasure and a privilege. Bold project. Seventh, the cosmists offered far-sighted and carefully considered answers to the most frequently asked question in Russian intellectual history, what is to be done? The answer to this perennial Russian question is inevitably a plan. And the plan offered by the cosmists is, if no more workable or realizable, at least bolder and more comprehensive than those offered by most other thinkers at most other times in Russian history. I ask you, do we have a bold and comprehensive plan and vision and project for our future or don't we? Peter Thiel once talked about it. He said that there's environmentalism, you know, like fueling, uh, getting off of all the fossil fuels and everything like that, zero emission. There's the Islamic vision of the future, but there's actually no 
other inspiring big projects for what should happen with the human future. Maybe Elon Musk is offering something with the colonization of Mars and making us an interplanetary species. But, uh, but here you see Cosmism had offered at least a bold and comprehensive vision. Think about it. Making the Earth a spaceship so that you can travel the cosmos and recover the particles of the previously departed to help with the physical resurrection of the dead. It's crazy, but still, maybe you need a crazy vision of the future in order to get anything interesting done. Finally, eighth point here, optimism. Even in the face of formidable challenges and in no way turning aside from the problems to be faced, the cosmists offered a positive, hopeful outlook. Despite the odds, they remain optimistic and do not succumb to what they see as today's Western doom and gloom. I'm going to read on in a minute, but I thought these were interesting things for us potentially to want to borrow experimentally as we develop our own vision for the future. By the end of the study, once again, you know, referring to this beautiful book, The Russian Cosmos, I just, I love that cover. Look at that. Oh, look at that beauty. Oops. By the end of the study, the author raises the question why Western readers should care at all about this topic and the figures associated with it. His answers are worth considering not only in relation to Russian cosmism. So like if this is a natively Russian, weird, mystical, anti-Western type thing, why should the West care? The first reason he gives is that because Russia is still a major power and an important potential partner in any future international attempt to create a world order. Well, I don't know if that's still the case, but uh, therefore, the more we can all know about the traditional cultural and intellectual tendencies of this partner, the better. And the cosmists present as clear and deep a look as any other into the past, present and possible future tendencies of what has traditionally been called the Russian soul. One of a number of missed opportunities in the West relationship to Russia, obviously. I've said before on my interview with Lawrence Southern that there should be strategic empathy there are good policy reasons why you want to at least look like you're making an effort to understand the other countries that you're dealing with. So this uh, book was written, obviously, before the quote unquote special military operation before the war. Uh, and even he's arguing, you know, make an effort to study the Russian cosmos and that can help in your cooperation with Russia. Obviously, we didn't do that. Obviously, that's one among a number of missed opportunities in Russia's uh, in our relationship with Ru Russia. Okay, I've used a similar argument before to justify careful study of Dugin's neo-Eurasianism. But I agree with the author that there are more and better reasons to know about the Russian cosmists than the need to understand an important neighbor and partner. So more than just like the strategic empathy. So let's look at the next set of reasons. We in the West can sometimes be too complacent, the author writes, about our intellectual, cultural, and political superiority. Too eager to assume that the values that we consider characteristic of our Western democracies are or should be, at least global if not universal, applicable to all our fellow residents of this planet, if not to other extraterrestrial neighbors as well. Positions taken by the Russian cosmists can challenge us to re-examine some of these assumptions and perhaps even offer a preview of positions that we may surprise ourselves by entertaining more seriously for ourselves in the future. In other words, we need not limit ourselves to learning about Russian schools of thought. We can be open to learning from them too. So what might we learn from cosmism, according to the author, George M. Young? First, the possibility of quote-unquote benign totalitarianism. Some of you may roll your eyes at this one. Could there be such a thing? Plato thought there could be, and many of the cosmists would agree. Unlikely as it may seem today, the liberal democratic model for future world governments may become less attractive than it is today. And the matter of who should have total or near total authority to govern an inevitable global union could become a pressing question in the future. The Russian cosmists have at least provided a starting point for the negotiations. Secondly, I wonder what you think about this one. We might learn from cosmism the task of overcoming death. The cosmists challenge us to consider precisely what death is, whether it is simply a cessation of all our chemical and electronic activity uh, or something more, and whether its elimination is indeed possible and, if so, desirable. Not simply the technological, but also the social, cultural, and moral aspects of the possible elimination of death and restoration of life 
are issues which the cosmists today and others in the future will be addressing. I'm going to over-exaggerate here, but we're going in the opposite direction. Instead of looking at the, well, okay, I'm a little bit outside of my area of expertise here, but you know, there are the new euthanasia technologies making it easier to die as opposed to new technologies uh, making it easier to live forever, if that's even possible and if that's even desirable. Is it? What do you think? Is it possible and desirable to live forever, to have the resurrection of the dead physically here and now, and to extend life indefinitely? All right, something else he says here that we might learn from cosmism, this school of mystical Russian religious futurism. The possibility of uniting disparate fields. I like this one, okay? You'll see some of this in Dugan as well. Other important future discussions to which the cosmists have already made significant contributions have to do with the possibility of uniting things that now appear disparate. Religion, science, art, and magic. Tradition and progress. Various fields of knowledge and activity. Diverse cultural traits, not to mention all the diametric oppositions and contradictions that Brudyayev lists as being united in the Russian soul. I'll probably read you that passage. It's pretty good at the start of the book, uh, so you'll know exactly what he's referring to. Generally, equality and biodiversity are not ultimate values for the Russian cosmists. For the most part, the cosmists take the position opposite ours and assume that if the whole is orderly and harmonious, the individual particle will be secure and well. If conflict should arise between the interests of the individual particle and the interests of the whole, the cosmists would almost unanimously prefer the interests of the whole. Okay, they're not uh, uh, individualists, atomists, particularists in that sense. Thus, if beyond Russia, in the future global village with every part wirelessly connected to every other part, if the common interests should happen to be considered more important and the particular individual interests less important, if the drive to forge unity should happen to overcome the drive to preserve diversity, the Russian cosmists again will have prepared a way. Okay, so maybe their time hasn't come yet, but it might come, and therefore it's not a bad idea to study them to have that ready to go. Another point, the relevance of mystical knowledge. Now, if you know anything about myself in this channel, you'll not be surprised that I find this to be appealing. Another contribution the cosmists have made but again, not universally accepted, is their attempt to rediscover possible spiritual and scientific truths in certain discarded pre-modern bodies of knowledge, such as astrology, alchemy, Kabbalah, and other traditional occult or esoteric researches. The degree to which the Russian cosmists have attempted to transform esoteric sources into intellectually respectable, though still controversial, philosophy, theology, and science can be regarded as a significant contribution to at least the Western esoteric tradition, if not to Western thought as a whole. I think that's an important point. And just in passing here, the author also mentions the possibility of pursuing these esoteric studies at reputable academic institutions, you know, where you could have like a chair of esoteric studies or something. And finally, they offer an optimistic vision of a scientific and spiritual future. Perhaps the most important contribution the Russian cosmists have made to modern intellectual life, however, he says, is to offer a centered, directed, positive vision in a largely uncentered, rudderless, negative time. In noting the differences between Russian cosmism and various schools of Western thought today, several commentators have argued that cosmist optimism and cosmist spiritual and scientific conviction are qualities much needed in today's global intellectual atmosphere. I ask you, isn't that the case? Do we have a spiritual and scientific conviction or just the kind of hollow scientism? Do we have a genuine optimism for the future or just the kind of time collapsing in on itself so that there's neither future nor past and the present is some sort of weird uh, stalemate? After reading this book, The Russian Cosmos, I'm gonna show it to you as often as I can because I just love that cover. Look at that beauty. After reading this book, it occurred to me that the Elon Musk-Lex Friedman friendship could be playfully interpreted as a harbinger of a coming American version of Russian cosmism, one that is not dystopian or dystopic like some people imagine, but rather an expansive, redemptive combination of science and deep spirituality such as described in this wonderful book. Hey, probably not. 
But the suggestion is meant as an invitation to read the book, which gives us so much to think about uh, and then to think about it. Okay, so that was my overview of this book. And I'm going to, you know, I, I sent this out to my mailing list as a newsletter some time ago. Okay, so you can subscribe to my newsletter if you want at uh, a couple of different places, millermanschool.com or duganbook.com. But anyways, I thought I'd present it to you here. Okay, very cool set of ideas. I like that it combines science and spirituality. I like the expansiveness and comprehensiveness. I like that it doesn't become uprooted from the national culture. Uh, the anti-Westernism, okay, you know, we don't want to be anti-Western here. I live in the West. I love the West. But, you know, these movements of deconstructionism and all of that, other alien abominations, maybe there's an alternative to them. So that's worth considering. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed that. Now I want to go over to the chat. And uh, just a reminder of where we started, for those of you who are uh, checking in and who missed the beginning, I started this video by telling you I'd never heard of Andrew Tate before yesterday, and today I see hundreds of videos and posts about him, so I ask on Twitter what's going on. And shortly after that, I saw, you know, even Cernovich is asking his followers, and he's got a million of them, do you know who Andrew Tate is? So somehow this guy broke through in a big way recently. For me, it was this video, Andrew Tate is the new Alex Jones which I'll be honest, I found pretty entertaining, especially with its uh, praise of high intellect at the start of the interview and his dad being a chess grandmaster. Okay, that's something that if you like the intellect, if you are in awe of the intellect, you could find appealing. And then because, you know, it says Andrew Tate is the new Alex Jones, I had, oh, sorry, this is a, another guy I follow who's really critical of, of uh, you know, something that Tate is doing. Now, I guess everybody has haters, but there are also scammers. So it's not so straightforward uh, when the hate is because of something legitimate and when it isn't. And then the Alex Jones things, this was just a cool episode. I saw Michael Malice, Robert Barnes talking about the legal warfare against Alex Jones. It really sounds like he got the shaft, like he was mistreated in every way possible from a legal analysis point of view. I'm just going to take Barnes's word for it because he's got the expertise that I lack in the legal analysis, and he walks through in a lot of detail how Jones got the shaft. And then I was thinking, controversial figures, Alex Jones, Alexander Dugan, uh, Andrew Tate, you know, where do we draw the line between what's controversy and what's contribution to our understanding of ourselves and of our world? You know, and then I just pointed out that, like, uh, Jones has this book on the Great Reset, doing really well on the charts, even though it's not out yet. And Great Reset is not just a total conspiracy theory for kooks and crackheads and nut jobs, because here's a book on its way out in October where you have really weighty uh, contributors in some cases. I don't know all of them, you know, but Michael Anton, Conrad Black, Victor Davis Hansen, these people are not, uh, are not jokers, okay? Some serious people taking seriously this notion. So where do you draw the line between a crazy thinker Oh yeah, Dugan has also written about the Great Reset. I haven't done a lot of promotion uh, on this channel of my book on Dugan, Inside Putin's Brain, but anyway, there you go. You see it. It's out as an ebook. It'll be out as a paperback soon. Collection of my essays on Dugan's political philosophy. Uh, but I have something new coming out on him soon about, about the Great Reset, so that's what I was thinking about him. And then we had this piece on Russian cosmism. Now I want to go over to the chat just to spend... Oh man, I'm always hitting the wrong button just to see how everybody's doing and uh, give you a chance to say what, give you a chance to say what you'd like to say. Uh, what was going on here in the chat? I'm going to go up a little bit here. Uh, okay. Coffeezilla is harsh, but usually a fair critic. Yeah, I like, listen, I don't know if he gets everything right or wrong, but here's his channel, you know, 1.24 million subscribers. I don't remember... I don't remember exactly what I saw of his that had me subscribe, but it seemed like a pretty good analysis and like he was genuinely, oh, you can't even see the screen, right? Hold on. Here it is. Yeah, it seemed like the video of his that I watched was a pretty good analysis of how not to get ripped off by a scam artist, okay? And his <laughs> one of his most recent videos or at least something that popped up for me was accusing, uh, you know, accusing Andrew Tate and his university of being... Uh, being a scam so i don't know you can uh, you can make your own judgment on that but i like his channel oh, you know something else i've really learned to appreciate and if you're here on youtube i'm sure you have as well 
that's channels where the videos are so well produced. Like, you know, they're paying a video producer good money or they just have incredible skills. I have so much respect for the good work that video producers do. Uh, I've been listening to some Strauss seminars recently and just noticed that you read in a similar manner. Uh, yeah, Oscar, I'm hugely indebted to, uh, to Strauss. You see that on screen or no? Man. Uh, a lot of things here with this program. I no longer even remember how to do well. Sorry about that. But yeah, Leo Strauss, the most important influence on everything that I do. Okay. And whenever I can uh, borrow something from him or refer people to him, I do. So there's probably no surprise. I don't really try to emulate his style, but, um, but I'm sure some of that happens. Okay. Andrew Tate is now a hyper real persona of the society of the spectacle. Social relationships and public interaction happen cybernetically. Tinder, Instagram, our human matrix digitalized. Well, he was saying it's an attention economy. And if you can uh, hack the matrix and get people's attention, then that's the key to like making money and being popular and all of these things. So I guess, you know, he's on everybody's feed today, so far as I can tell. Uh, Marco pimping, which I guess is, you know, one of the ways that he has characterized what he does. Here we go. He's characterized what he does as pimping and He's been characterized as a pimp. Pimping is death sentence in society. I want to live. He says girls are profiting from prostitution. But if he had a sister, I bet he would not uh, do it in a million years. Not a chance he ever told it to do it. Yeah, what he said, what I heard him say in his interview with Pomp, he said, look, uh, well, I said a lot of things, okay? But one of his arguments was, if you have women doing work on a webcam with a man, for a man, however you want to characterize that, Maybe they're naked, maybe they're not naked. He said, webcam girls have prevented more male suicides than anything else you can think of. Because in many cases, these lonely guys want nothing more, sad as it might be, than to have somebody know their name, remember their birthday, give them attention, smile at them, and spend time with them. So that's sad, but it may be true. And he also said in that interview with Pomp that, look, when a woman is doing uh, camp webcam work, she's not in an alley doing prostitution. It's safer for her, which is probably true. And uh, anyway, it's weird. Like on one hand, you know, that's another situation where you kind of definitely want to say, no, you know, pimping, prostitution, all of that obviously falls outside of the realm of what you want morally in a good society. But of course, uh, morally well-ordered good society is also a kind of utopia. And there are a million moral trade-offs in policy and in these other areas. So what if it were true that webcam girls have prevented many male suicides and that to be a webcam girl is much safer than to be a prostitute? And finally, that if you didn't have webcam girls, you would have you know, those women being uh, in the streets selling their sex, their attention, and their affection. So uh, anyway, that was Marco responding to why, you know, I'd asked Marco earlier in response to one of his comments, why would you, uh, again, I don't know this Andrew Tate guy that well, but obviously his attitude towards women is a big, is a big thing. And I guess he made his millions like uh, pimping women out on webcams. And that's something he talked about with Pomp. What, uh, why do you think the occult would weigh heavier in Russia? That's a good question. Why do I think the occult would weigh heavier in Russia during the 90s? Uh, those of you who just who just uh, just joined us, let me give you that quote again. It's down here. A study of Russian publications in the 1990s found that some 39% of all nonfiction books published in Russian in that decade had something to do with the occult. I don't know. What do you what do you guys think? Why why is that the case? Why would that be the case? Is that completely crazy, or is there something to it? Uh, another thing that the cosmists were on about, the overcoming of death. Yeah, you know, this book covers some of the debate, you know, because Fyodorov or Fedorov, right here, Nikolai Fedorov, he was interested in the physical resurrection of the dead, like as a real project, going to collect their particles from space and reconstitute them into a living being. But some of his followers, they interpreted resurrection differently. Okay, so they were not all interested in uh, as physical an interpretation as he was of resurrection and of immortality and of overcoming death and all of that. That's why I, I do recommend reading the book. The debates there are kind of weird, but pretty fascinating. Uh, in Flames writes here, the cosmists attempt to conjoin spiritual insight with science, 
is very similar with Schelling's project to showcase how the study of the absolute is ingrained within subject and nature. Do you guys think that there has been a, an unbridgeable gap introduced between science and spirituality? And that when you have scientists trying to fill that gap, they're doing a disservice to the spiritual phenomena, like they're um, doing some sort of reductive treatment of it. You know, what should be the relationship between science and spirituality in your view? There are thinkers, I guess, like Ian McGilchrist. I just learned about him pretty recently, but I guess he's somebody who, through the study of the hemispheres of the brain, is trying to find ways to put holism and intuition and mysticism back onto scientific footing. But the cosmists have their unique version of that. And uh, I was pretty fascinated reading the book. Um, what else do we have here? So regarding the wedding of the cosmos soteriology to empirical science, there's a very interesting American biologist named Raymond Peet, who's very inspired by cosmism. Okay, that's interesting. He seems to revive the attitude of science being a project contra death. Yeah, good. Should science have as its goal physical immortality or not? And if not, why not? And if so, why? Okay, well, listen, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I know these topics are pretty unrelated. On one hand, Andrew Tate, controversial thinkers, uh, people who have hacked the attention matrix and suddenly we're seeing videos and posts about them and here I am talking about them in my live stream. And uh, where you draw the line between controversy and contribution when it comes to thinkers who are you know, walking that line or torching it. Uh, some nice books to be published soon on The Great Reset. Alex Jones there and this collection against the Great Reset. My little thing on Russian cosmism. All right, that was fun. Okay, I'll do more of these from time to time. Uh, if you want full courses of mine, go to millermanschool.com. You want to follow me on Twitter, M underscore Millerman. Subscribe, like, share, etc., etc. Uh, thanks for your time. Nice to be with you. See you in the next video.